Good. I ask it you. Hi, how are you? Well, like I have to change at about 12 30. I have to go for a lunch. So I already got myself, but I have a Zoom now. So I don't know why what's happening, why it's not, I'm not on. It's, okay, what? I was supposed to get on the Zoom call the other day and it just wasn't working on my phone. So all the same, right? Everything all the same. same. Make sure to get under the beds. There's, I tried to get as much as I could, the dust, but there's always more dust. Okay, we're going to try to move this bed a little bit from the wall and see if we can bring a little bit. You don't have to do that. Just, you know, as long as you go behind. The only thing is I moved the uh, sofa. Why, why am I? Oh, here. I don't want to be part of this thing. No, 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 no. I don't want to be in the picture. Well, you need to, then you need to, you need to check the, the camera. I know. Oh, gee. Um, I moved the sofa in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, and I, but I couldn't lift. Uh, hello, everyone. Do you hear me now? As you can see, let me show you. You see yes. how you see how the carpet got all. Hi, so everyone. You can straighten the carpet. Yeah, but you might have to lift a little bit. Not I hear somebody. If you could please, we're ready to begin the class on page fifty-four. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, very exciting Torah portion. It's the third Torah portion of the book of Bereshit. And the reason I say it's exciting is because here's where the Jewish story begins. Uh, starting this, this week, we begin the story of the Jewish nation. Up until now, we were learning about uh, Adam and Eve and their descendants and then Noah and his descendants. But now we start the story of the Jewish people, which begins with the first Jewish couple, Abraham and Sarah. And... Obviously, the rest is history. We're here today, 3,800 years later, thanks to this incredible couple that we're going to start learning about this week. And uh, unlike uh, the world up until now, which was destroyed during the times of the flood or during the times of the Tower of Babel, 
Uh, there are going to be obviously challenges and situations going forward in the lives of Abraham and Sarah. No life is without its challenges and struggles, including the first Jewish couple. But basically, we now start an amazing story of the Jewish nation. Abraham and Sarah, their children, Isaac and Rebekah, and then going on to the Jacob and his wives, and then the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the Jewish people as we know it. So this is where the book of Genesis, everything up until now was just background information till we get to this story. The story of the Torah is the story of the Jewish people. And this is really the starting point of the story of, of the Jewish people. So how exciting it is. And let us, let us begin the journey together with Abraham. And it actually begins with a journey. The name of the Torah portion is Lech Lecha. Why? Because the first command, the first instruction that God gives Abraham is go. And then you have the word Lecha, which means... In the art school, it says, for yourself, which is Rashi's interpretation. That Rashi said, this journey that I'm asking you to take is for your benefit. Go from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land that I will show you, which, of course, was the land of Israel. And when Abraham arrives there, God tells him, this is the land that I will give to your descendants. Now, it's just absolutely remarkable, uh, miraculous, that the Torah predicts everything that would happen to the Jewish people right here. God tell, tells them to go to Israel and says, this land will be for you and your descendants. And today there's an election in Israel where we're democratically voting our next government in Israel. So here we are in the land that God told Abraham to go to. Uh, as, as a single person with his wife. And he says, this is, will be the land of the Jewish people. And indeed, it is the land of the Jewish people. And of course, God is going to tell Abraham, and next week's Torah portion, look up to the heavens, and your children will be like the stars in the heaven. So all the predictions, all the prophecies about the Jewish nation are all spelled out in, in these Torah portions that we're going to read. And when you see that 3,800 years later, everything has been fulfilled, Clearly, you know that the Torah could have only been uh, written by God who knows the future and can predict the future uh, in the most remarkable way 4,000 years in advance. But now let's start with the actual, there's so much to be said, but let's just, just jump right in. The first commandment given to the first Jew is Lech Lecha, go to the land that I will show you. Leave behind your land, your birthplace, your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. Now, one of the famous questions on this Torah portion is, there doesn't seem to be any background information about why Abraham was chosen to be the father of the Jewish nation. You know, even last week when we read about Noah, it started by saying Noah was a righteous man, he was perfect, he walked with God, and then we understand why God chose to save Noah during the flood. But in this case, all we read was last week that there was a man by the name of Terach who lived in a place called ur -Kazdim. And he journeyed from ur -Kazdim with his family to go to the land of Canaan. And they arrived in a place called Haran and they settled there and Terach dies there. So all we know is that Terach had a son, Avraham, and Avraham had a wife, Sarai. We don't know about his righteousness, his accomplishments, his greatness, nothing. Next thing we know, God tells Abraham, okay, go to the land that I will show you, and everything's history. You're going to become a great nation. God tells him right up front. <laughs> I mean, just read the opening words of the parasha. It's like all prophecy that came true. God chooses this person, Avram, and says, go for yourself from your land, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you, I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed, shall bless themselves by you. This is 
God's promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago to some random guy by the name of Abraham. We don't even know why God chose him. He we have no stories in the Torah about him or his accomplishments. But what's amazing is all this happened. Just yesterday, I was visiting with a member of our shul. And he told me something interesting. He said he was watching CNN, I guess, with everything that's going on in the world, anti-Semitism. And so one of the reporters on CNN said that there are 15 million Jews in the world. And he was shocked. I guess he didn't know. He went on Google to look it up. He couldn't believe it. He thought maybe 15 million in America. Everyone always thinks there must be 100 million Jews, a couple of hundred million Jews. We're just a tiny nation, 15 million people worldwide, globally. But this is what God said. I'll make you into a great nation. You will be blessed. I will make your name renowned. All the nations of the world will be blessed through you. Those who bless you shall be blessed. Those who curse you shall be cursed. Every civilization that was a blessing to the Jewish people became prosperous. Those who didn't, unfortunately, those who cursed us were cursed. So all of this is foretold and predicted. Now, let's end. leave behind your father's place, your birthplace, your relatives, and go to a new land. Now, this first commandment must be everything that, it, you know, if it's the first commandment to the first Jew, it must be a very all-encompassing message about Judaism. What is it about this commandment that encapsulates the heart of being a Jew? And the essence of being a Jew? And the answer is very obvious. What is God telling Abraham? To be a Jew, you have to be willing to go it alone. You have to leave behind your culture, your society, your background, your upbringing. You have to be willing to stand and be different than others and not just try to blend in and fit in and you know uh, assimilate. How do 15 million Jews survive in a world of this month, they're predicting 8 billion people are going to be on this earth. If not, by preserving your identity and standing firm in your convictions and beliefs and morals and ethics and traditions and practices. And that's what it means to be Avraham. Avraham is called Ivri, the first name of Jews before Judah, and we became Jews after. Avraham is called Ivri, the Hebrew. What does the word Hebrew mean? The word Ivri means the other side. Our rabbis say the whole world was on one side and Abraham stood on the other side. He stood alone. Everyone was worshiping idols and the sun and the moon and the stars and Abraham served one God and taught the world monotheism. And today most of the world practices monotheistic faiths. <laughs> so, Going back to the question we touched upon, why was Abraham chosen? So if you look in the Midrash, there are many answers given. He stood up to his father, who was an idolater. He smashed up. There's a famous Midrash, you may have heard it, that Abraham's own father had an idol shop. His father was out. He took a stick and smashed all the idols because he was protesting his father's idolatry. And then he put the stick in the hand of the biggest idol. And when his father came home, his father said, what happened? He said, the biggest idol went on a rampage and broke, killed all the other idols, smashed all the other idols. And his father, Terah, said, but that's impossible. Idols can't do anything. They can't move. They're sta stationary. And then he said, well, dad, if they're stationary and they can't move and they can't act, why do you worship them? So that's a famous major story. There's even the story that Terach's father took him to Nimrod, who was the king at the time. And he said he's refusing to believe in our gods. And Nimrod gave Abraham a choice. Either bow down to the idols or we'll throw you in the fire. And Abraham said, I will not do it. And they threw him in the fire and he walked through the fire like a garden. He was miraculously saved. So all these stories that our rabbinic literature, Midrashim, tell us about Abraham's greatness. But in the Torah, none of these stories are recorded. And the reason is there are many answers given, but one answer is that there's two paradigms for serving God. 
one is what is initiated by man. So, so I decide I want to do this for God, or I'm going to perform this act, ritual, sacrifice for God. And that elevates me and refines me and brings me closer to God. However, the second paradigm is where God initiates the relationship. And God reaches out to us and asks us to do what is known as a mitzvah. Now, which form of worship is greater or higher? <clears throat> so on the one hand, when we initiate something, it's our own effort, it's our own initiation which makes it in a way more special and we become more refined and elevated as a result but on the other hand as high as we elevate goals things are limited as well but when god initiates a relationship with us through a simple mitzvah we can transcend all of our limitations because it's god's initiation so to give you an example, if I decide I want to have a relationship with the president of the United States, so I could buy a ticket and go to Washington and I could stand in front of the White House with a sign saying, I love you, Mr. President. I could do all these things, hours and presents. I could do all sorts of things. But when the president calls me and says, listen, I need you to do something for me. Now the relationship takes on a whole new level. Because now it's not based on my capacity, it's on his capacity. And as the president, he takes all of his resources and makes them available to me to fulfill my relationship and goal with him. Same thing with God. Man, no matter what we do for God, it's minuscule. It's small. Now it elevates us, it perfects us, it refines us, <clears throat> but it doesn't achieve the level of as up until now, whatever Abraham did was his own initiative. So as great as it was, it had limitations. With the first commandment, go to the land that I will show you. For the first time, Abraham was responding to an instruction, to a direction from God. And now it's not on the level of Abraham as great as it, it's on God's level. God is now starting this relationship and investing himself in this relationship and that takes on a whole different dimension so the message is <clears throat> and the reason why there's no background story no bio about abraham is to tell us that as much as man seeks to do on their own accord it's all good but it's nothing in comparison to fulfilling god's mitzvot his directives because that's where God elevates you to his level, transcending the physical limitations of time and space. So to give you a practical analogy or question, if you have a choice, I could either go to a mountaintop and meditate and think about God for 10 hours straight, or I could do the most simplest mitzvah, Whatever it is, lighting Shabbos candles for a woman, giving charity, um, uh, putting on tefillin, uh, keeping Shabbos, uh, putting up a mezuzah, whatever it may be. Even though there's a lot more effort in getting to the mountaintop and meditating for 10 hours, while the other myths of putting up the mezuzah takes five minutes, the meditation on the mountain, God didn't ask you to do that, so to speak. You're doing it on your own which is great, but it doesn't transcend to the next level, to the next realm of the infinite. But when you do the simple mitzvah of knocking a mezuzah on your doorpost, now you've connected with God through his will, through his initiation, which he asked you to put a mezuzah on your doorpost. So the, the relationship takes on a whole new dimension. So that's one reason given amongst many. But let's go a little deeper into this command. Go to the land that I will show you. The obvious part of the commandment is that God doesn't tell him where he's going. God just says, go to the land I will show you. God leads him to the land of Israel and says, this is the land for you and your descendants. But why doesn't God is going? 
Why is it an open-ended instruction? Just go to the land that I will show you. And again, lots of commentary. But just one or two answers. There's an old adage you've heard it a million times. It's not the destination, it's the journey. And what God is saying is, as the measure says, that God said to Abraham, your life like a beautiful bottle of if a beautiful bottle of perfume is in one room, only that room benefits from it. But if you take it and travel around with it, it spreads the fragrance and the aroma all over. So God says to Abraham, Abraham, you are like this very precious, expensive bottle of perfume. Your deeds, your righteousness is so wonderful. I don't want you to stay in one place. I want you to journey forth so that you will spread your teachings, your goodness, your righteousness everywhere you go. And therefore, it's not just about getting to the land of Israel. Yeah, that's the destination to bring you to the land of Israel and give the land to your descendants. But even the journey is part of the destination because everywhere you go, you'll spread yourself. And that's why it says, Lech Lecha, go with yourself. Could have just said, Lech, go. It says, go with yourself. And again, this is a very important instruction for all of us that every day we go on journeys. And we always have a goal or a destination in mind. But along the way, we encounter different people, different circumstances, different challenges sometimes. And we have to realize that's not an impediment to our destination. That's part of the journey. That's part of the destination. God brings us to different places and different circumstances for a specific reason. And wherever we go, we have to ask ourselves, why was I put here? Why am I in this environment, set of circumstances, predicament. What can I do here where I am at right now? Like that bottle of perfume, am I spreading a good fragrance? What encounter, what meeting, what person could I impact wherever I am, whenever I am, and so on. So that's another idea. But to continue to uh, explore this first commandment, to leave behind your birthplace, your father's house, <coughs> and your country. In other words, all the spheres of influence were impacted by our society, by our birthplace, by our home. And what the Torah is saying is that, you know, in, in, in modern day psychology, you know, people go to see therapists and the therapists trace everything back to their childhood, which is true your home environment, appearance, the influences, whatever happened in your childhood goes with you for the rest of your life. But what the God is telling the first Jew is you can transcend that. You could journey forth from all of that. Look at Abraham. He was born to a father who was an idolater. But look, he became the father of monotheism. In other words, the first Jew is not someone who came from a righteous religious Jewish home or anything like that. He came from of idolatry, but yet he became the pioneer and the founder of Judaism, telling you that you're not confined, restricted, bound to your past. We could take our past with us and use it to learn, to grow, but we don't have to feel ever that based on our past, we are um, doomed or somehow uh, destined to a certain future based on our past, we could chart a new course like Abraham. There's another very subtle idea that I just want to touch on before we move on from this opening commandment. You know, it sounds very dramatic. Leave the land of your father, your birthplace, your country, to the land that I will show you. Like a full break from the past, right? <clears throat> it's like, a very uh, shocking type of a command. You know, like God comes to him and says, okay, leave everything and go to a new place. Start all over again, right? But if you actually look at what happened at the end of last week's Torah portion, the Torah said that Abraham's father, Terah, took his family on a journey. And where was he journeying to? It says it right there in verse 31. He took the family, which is his son Abraham, his daughter-in-law Sarai, 
and his other family members, and they went to go towards Artsakh, Canaan, the land of Canaan, which is Israel. In other words, Abraham's father was already heading towards Israel. And then, then they settled in a place called Haran on the way. And then Terach, seemingly due to old age, in those days people lived longer, he was 205 years old, he died in Haran. So where is Abraham and Sarah in Haran? And now God says, leave your birthplace, your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you, the land of Canaan. But truth be told, Abraham was no longer in his birthplace, in his father's land or his father's house, because his father Terah had already begun the journey. That's what we had in the end of last week's Torah portion, that Terah took his and they left or caused them towards the land of Israel and settled in Haran. So by the time God comes to Abraham and says, go to the land that I will show you <coughs> and leave your father's house, your birthplace, your country, he was already out of Ur Kasdim. He was already in Haran on the way to Israel. So on the one hand, it sounds like Abraham's starting a new journey. On the other hand, his father really started this journey before him. And he's continuing, actually, his father's journey towards the land of Israel. Now, the Torah doesn't tell us why Terach wanted to go to Israel. But perhaps Terach himself started to regret his idolatrous practices and the people in his society. And he wanted to start a new life. And he began the journey. And his son only continued what he had already begun. And I think there's a lot of very interesting insight in all of this. Because this is really the story of every person. On the one hand, Every person wants to chart their own course in life. And sometimes we want to deliberately make our own mark and distinguish ourselves. You know, people always tell me, you know, the older I get, the more I realize I'm like my parents, right? When you're young, you think, you know, Mark Twain once said that I left my house when I was 16. I came back at 21. It's amazing how much my parents learned in five years. In other words, when you're young, you think, oh, I know better than my parents. I'm whatever. And I'm going to do my own thing. And as you get older, you realize you're reverting back to your parents, right? Meaning you're more, you have more of them inside of you than you ever thought you had. And that's what Abraham maybe is being told. On the one hand, you're starting a new journey, but really you're continuing the journey of your parents. And that's really the dichotomy of all of our lives that, on the one hand, we're each unique, distinct individuals. On the other hand, we all carry the past, the genes, the teachings, the character of our parents, ancestors with us. And while we're going forward, we're also reconnecting with who we are in our past as well. Um, Okay, um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things on the opening page of this week's Torah portion is that when Abraham heads out on his journey, by the way, he's 75 years old. And by the way, I rabbis say that God tested Abraham 10 times before he chose him to be the patriarch of our Jewish nation. The first test is Lech Lecha, leave your birthplace, your homeland, to the land that I will show you. The last one will be the binding of Isaac. At the end of next week's Torah portion. <laughs> Abraham had to pass 10 tests. Just like every person has to go through tests before they can be worthy of whatever blessings that God wants to give us. And we always have to realize that in life we're often being tested. So Abraham's 75 years old. And who does he take? He takes his wife. And by the way, he's Avram. He didn't get the letter hey yet. Sarai, without the letter hey, Sarai. <coughs> they were given these names later when they became chosen as the first Jewish couple. They take their nephew Lot, who is an orphan, on this journey. He's going to come up later in the Torah portion a lot. But they take their nephew Lot. And then it says something remarkable. It says, Abraham, Sarah took their nephew Lot, they had no children at the time, and they headed and they took 
the souls, it's the last words on the, in the, the art scroll here, nefesh asher the souls they made in Haran. And Rashi said, what do you mean the souls they made? How do you make souls? And the answer is obvious. The only way to make a soul is by inspiring a soul. And that's what Abraham and Sarah did. They created souls. What does that mean? They inspired people to have a relationship with one God, not serve idols. And now that God said, Lech Lecha, you're going to a new land to start a new people, your descendants, Abraham took all the souls that he made. He had followers, he had disciples, he had students who were learning from Abraham's ways, and he took all of them. So Abraham and Sarah is the first couple that teaches us the idea of not being like Noah, who only saved himself and his family, but taking others with you inspiring others surely as Jews today our fellow Jews to not just be practicing on your own but trying to draw people closer to God through your example through your sharing what you know what you've learned Lubavitcher Rebbe once famously said to someone that if you know the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet Aleph and Bet and another Jew only knows the first letter Aleph you have an obligation to teach them the letter bet. In other words, you don't have to be a big scholar, rabbi, teacher to be a teacher of Torah. Everyone knows things about Judaism that some other Jew doesn't know. And therefore, whatever you do know, you have to share. So they head out towards the land of Canaan. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about the big picture question about Abraham, because there's a big question about Abraham. <laughs> what made Abraham unique? So I told you the story that the major says that he smashed the idols of his father, which, which would show that Abraham showed one of the characteristics of being a Jew, which is to stand up and protest against, in Abraham's case, it was idolatry, but to be willing to go against the tide, against the trend, to swim upstream rather than downstream. If everyone is doing something, doesn't mean it's right. And therefore be willing to stand and challenge or break metaphorically the idols of the time. Just like Abraham smashed the idols of his father, in every generation there are things that people idolize whether it's money, whether it's whatever it is. To be a Jew means that just because society idolizes something and worships it, and it, it doesn't have to be something physical like money. It could be an ideology, you know, that, that mainstream culture begins to buy into and believe in and promote that is wrong, that is immoral, or whatever it may be. And to be a Jew is be willing to stand up and speak out against it and challenge it. Like Abraham, one man against the whole world. That's the courage of being able to stand up for your convictions and not be persuaded by the masses. That's one idea. Maimonides famously says that, my, that Abraham was like a philosopher. <laughs> Everyone worshipped God, uh, idols and he started to contemplate at a young age. What's going on here? Could the sun be the God? Could the moon be the God? Could the stars be the God? And he started to realize none of these are gods. They're just being controlled by a higher power. Until he came to discover one true God and informed that relationship and began to teach others about that. So according to Maimonides, what stood out about Abraham was his discovery of God. But there's another very beautiful Medrash that says Abraham was journeying one day, and this is the words of the Medrus. He saw a palace engulfed in flames. And Abraham stopped to look at this beautiful palace engulfed in flames. And here's what the Medrus says. Abraham said out loud, is there a master to this home? Is there an owner to this palace? I see this palace burning. And no one seems to be trying to put out the fire. And suddenly, the owner of the palace comes to the window. 
and says to Abraham, I'm the master of this palace. Now, this is a medrash that's an analogy, obviously, a metaphor. But what is it telling us about Abraham? And again, many interpretations. This is a very classic, famous medrash. But one beautiful interpretation is as follows. You know what perturbed Abraham? When he discovered there must be one God that controls the world. You see, what perturbed Abraham is what perturbs every human being until today, 3,800 years later. What's the big question of life? On the one hand, you see a palace. You see a beautiful mansion. When you see a palace, what do you know? You know that there's order, design, planning. Someone made this beautiful palace. It didn't happen by itself. So you admire the beauty and the order of the palace. So too, when you look at the world, you say, wow, what a world. Just absolutely incredible. Someone made this beautiful world with everything in it. Clearly, it's, it's magnificent. It's awesome. It is just inspiring to see how beautiful the world God made. But then what do you see? The world is engulfed in flames like the palace. You see destruction. You see evil. You see tragedy. And you say, one minute, I'm confused. On the one hand, there's a palace, a beautiful palace. Clearly, someone built this palace. On the other hand, the palace is engulfed in flames. Tragedy, misfortune, evil, wars, destruction, hatred. So you say, how do you reconcile the order of the world with the disorder of human behavior? <clears throat> and you asked the same question that Abraham asked. Is there a master to this palace? Why isn't anyone putting out the fire? Where is the owner of the palace? And that's the question human beings ask. If there is a God who is the master of this palace, who created this palace, why is he allowing the fires and the flames to rage and destroy the palace he made? Why doesn't he put out the fire? Is that a good question? The best question, right? The most confusing question. And that's the question Abraham was struggling with. On the one hand, clearly there's a God who designed all of this. On the other hand, why, if there is a God, is he allowing the world to be destroyed through human actions? And this is where the master of the palace appears in the window and basically says to Abraham, yes, there is a master. I'm the master. But you can't just stand there and look at the palace burning. You need to help me put out the fire. In other words, what God is saying to mankind is that, yes, I made this orderly, beautiful world. And yes, sometimes man destroys the order in the world. However, that's why we're here for. We're here to partner with God in putting out the flames, in healing the brokenness of the world. Now, why does God set the world up in a way that he wants our help or needs our help? We're just like powerless human beings. And this gets to the heart of Judaism of two weeks ago, Torah portion, that God made every human being in his image. Now, what does it mean to be in God's image? It doesn't mean that God has hair on his head or nose or feet or hands. It's a spiritual metaphor. By definition, God is free. God is not limited. We are the only creatures that have free choice. Animals don't have free choice. Even angels don't have free choice. We are in God's image. We are free like God is free. God granted us the greatest gift, the gift of freedom. All of life has meaning because we have freedom. So therefore we get to choose. And therefore we get the satisfaction and the reward of making good choices. And sometimes we get the disappointment and the consequences of making bad choices. But because we have freedom, we can always change that and improve and do teshuvah and become better. But without freedom, none of that's possible. Without freedom, we would be no different than an animal on the lower realm or an angel on the higher realm. We would be static. We would be one position, never increasing, never growing or declining. And a decline is an opportunity for a greater, every descent is an opportunity for a greater ascent. 
So why, when Cain picked up whatever he picked up, a rock, to kill his brother Abel, didn't God stop him? Because God gave him free choice. God warned him to control his temper, but God says, I gave you the gift of free will. Why didn't God stop the Nazis? Cursed be their name. Because God gave us free will. So man gets the gift of freedom, which is what makes life pleasurable. If you try to imagine your life one day without freedom, what it would feel like. Nothing has meaning without freedom. <clears throat> what is love? Love is, I choose to love you. That's why love is beautiful, because we choose to love each other. Because there's another option, we could hate each other. If I choose to forgive somebody, it's very beautiful, meaningful. Why or someone chooses to forgive me? Because it shows that we have freedom to choose our course and do the right thing. So everything is meaningful because there's an alternative. If there's no alternative, if human beings could only love, then love wouldn't mean anything because everyone would love everyone automatically and there would be no other option. It's only because I choose to love, to act lovingly, that loving deeds are meaningful. And that's true in every realm. So God tells Abraham, yes, there is a master to the palace. And yes, the palace is in flames. There are many situations that the world is self-destructing or human beings are destroying the world. Just look at what's going on in the world today. But that's why we're here, to be God's partners, to put out the flames. <coughs> now, there's a lot going on in this week's Torah portion. <clears throat> so let's go to another famous story. Okay, the next big story in the Parsha is page 56, if you're in the Buatz Kuchomish. Abraham arrives in the land of Israel, and now God throws him a challenge. What's the challenge? A hunger in the land. Now, we all know later the story of Joseph. There was a hunger in Israel. They went to Egypt to buy food. But this is the first time that the family of Abraham goes to Egypt to get food. There was no food in Israel, Canaan. So Abraham and Sarah go to live temporarily in the land of Egypt so they could have food. But here's something very uh, interesting happens. When they get to Egypt, Abraham says, listen, you're a very beautiful woman. And Pharaoh has instructions to his border control people that when a beautiful woman arrives in Egypt, send them right away to the palace to be part of Pharaoh's harem. So if you tell them you're my wife, they're going to kill me to confiscate you. So lie and say you're my sister. And sure enough, that's what Sarah does. She says, the sister and Sarah is confiscated or abducted, taken away. God strikes Pharaoh and his household until ultimately he releases Sarah back to Abraham with gold and silver and cattle and presents. And that's when they go on to a place called Beth El, which is in Israel, where they made an altar. And that's the episode with Egypt and the famine and Pharaoh abducting Sarah. And this is like a really uh, wild story. But again, all the stories in the Torah are there for a very important reason. And Nachmanides, 13th century scholar, says that this story is here as a prelude to the story of the Jews going into Egypt when there was a famine in the land of Israel. And Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, goes to Egypt to find refuge and then becomes enslaved there for 210 years. <laughs> and he says that, and this is pretty shocking, but Nachmanides says this, is that, you know why the Jews have to suffer in Egyptian exile? Because Abraham and Sarah sinned, he says, by going to Egypt when there was a famine. They should have had faith in God and not left the land of Israel. God said, go to the land of Israel. Why are you leaving Israel to Egypt for food? Trust in God. And furthermore, he says that Abraham made a mistake by endangering his wife, by saying, say you're my sister, and then they'll abduct you. 
and relying on a miracle that Sarah would be saved from the house of Pharaoh. Now, this is a very uh, complex subject, obviously, because there are a lot of commentaries that, that defend everything that Abraham and Sarah did. Because if there's a famine, God wants you to find the solution. He doesn't want you to just rely on a miracle. If there's food in another country, you should go there. And so on and so forth. <clears throat> but what Maimonides, or Nachmanides, is trying to say is that there's justice in the world. Things don't happen randomly. And the reason why the Jews had to go to slavery later was because Abraham and Sarah chose to go to Egypt in the time of famine, uh, which was a lack of faith or proper faith in God under the circumstances. Now, to take Nachmanides one step further, later in this parsha, we're going to find that Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. And Abraham had a second wife whose name was Hagar, like a maidservant. And Sarah tells her husband, Abraham, in this week's Torah portion, I'm not having any children. God told us we're going to have children, but we're not having any so far. So why don't you have a child with Hagar? And in those days, I guess um, a handmaid's child was like your child. So Hagar goes and has... Hagar goes, Abraham goes and impregnates Hagar, has a baby with Hagar. And we all know, we all know who this baby was, Ishmael, the father of the Arab nations. And it's so amazing. The Torah predicts everything. But what happened was when Hagar has the child, she becomes a little arrogant. Because now, even though she's the handmaid, she feels she's superior to Sarah because she has a child with Abraham and Sarah doesn't. And the Torah says, Vatekal Gevirta Now She started to mistreat Sarah. And at one point, Sarah says, send her away from the house. And that's what Abraham does. He sends away Hagar and the child. And here's where an angel, I'm sorry, I misspoke. When she got pregnant and she knew she was having a baby, she already started to mistreat Sarah because she's like, I'm pregnant from Abraham and you're not. At that point, Sarah sends her away. An angel comes to her and says, don't worry. You're going to have a child. And you'll name the son Yishmael, the father of the Arab nations, Ishmael. And listen to what the Torah says at the end of the sixth Torah portion. The angel tells, and you tell me if this came true, 100%. I'll read it in the English. An angel of Hashem said to behold, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And shall call his name Ishmael, has heard your prayer. And here's the English translation. And he shall be a wild ass of a man. And everyone's hand against him. And over all his brothers he sh shall he dwell. This is the prediction of the baby that Hagar would have. The father of the Arab nations that he will be a wild ass of a man. His hand will be against everyone. Everyone's hand will be against him and over all of his brothers shall he dwell. So when you look at Islamic fundamentalism, terrorism, the struggle between Jews and Arabs, it was all foretold when Ishmael was still in his mother's womb. Now, <coughs> now, Nachmanides says, why did this happen? Why are we in constant struggle with the Arabs? Why is he a wild ass of a man? So remember, Nachmanides was the one who said that the Jews went into slavery in Egypt because 
Abraham didn't have, have enough faith of God to stay in the land of Israel, but went to Egypt during his time to find food. That's why his descendants had to go to buy food in Egypt and become enslaved. In the same vein, Achmanani says here the same thing. He says, the verse says that when she got pregnant, when, um, when, when Hagar became pregnant, so the verse says that, I'll just read it to you in the English. He consorted, meaning Abraham consorted with Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was lowered in her esteem. She started to disrespect Sarah. So Sarah said to Abraham, the outrage against me is due to you. It was I who gave my maidservant into your bo bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became lowered in her esteem. And he's, she's upset at Abraham. She said, let us judge between me and you. And then Abraham says to Sarah to make his wife happy. He says, your maidservant is in your hand. Do as you see fit. And Sarah dealt harshly with her. This is the Torah. Torah says it very clearly. Vataneha Sarah. Sarah afflicted her and she fled. Hagar fled the house because of Sarah's oppression of her. Says Nachmanes, because Sarah dealt harshly with her and oppressed her and she had to flee from the house, run away, that's why her son became the boy, Ishmael, who would torment the Jewish people in return for what Sarah had done to the mother. There's a quid per quo, there's a balance, there's a justice in the world. Now, this is a very strong commentary of Nachmanides because it's being a little bit critical of Sarah and Abraham when he left the land of Israel to go to Egypt. But <clears throat> it brings some insight into the whole question of the book of Genesis when we read about our patriarchs and our matriarchs. You know, in other religions, in Christianity, they have sainthood. Certain people are saints. In Judaism, there's no such thing as a saint. Name me any great figure right here. Nachmanah is already criticizing Abraham and Sarah and saying they made mistakes. They left Egypt when they should, Israel to Egypt when they should not have. Sarah afflicted uh, her maidservant. That's why Ishmael was taking revenge against the Jews. Moses struck the rock. Uh, the 12 tribes sold Joseph into slavery. King David had his incident with Bathsheba. In other words, in Judaism, the greatest righteous people make mistakes and fall sometimes. Joshua was involved in the golden calf. I mean, the list goes on and on. So the greatest tzaddikim have their failings. And the worst sinners aren't beyond redemption. The worst sinners in, in Judaism could always do teshuva, could have saving grace. <clears throat> and in other words, what Judaism is saying is it's not black and white, good and evil. There's a lot of gray. Now, obviously, there are people who are primarily righteous. And then there are people who are primarily wicked. But there are stories upon stories of wicked people who did great things. We don't have enough time to get into it, but there are many such stories. And then there are very righteous people who made mistakes. And so it's not as simplistic as the good guys and the bad guys. We all have different degrees of complexity Human beings are not black and white. Life circumstances are not black and white. And therefore, there's always that gray area. And therefore, even when we go into the commentaries on the very patriarchs and matriarchs of our nation, the greatest of all, we start finding certain subtleties. And King David, who we read his book of Psalms all, every day, had an incident with Bathsheba. And what it teaches us is that we're all on a journey, always trying to improve, always trying to get better. But we have to realize <coughs> that no one's perfect. And on the other hand, nobody's completely bad. We always have to look for the good and bad people even. And even if you're a righteous person, as it says in Prakiva, don't believe in yourself. Don't trust yourself till the day you die. You never know even though if you're righteous, how you may um, succumb to a temptation, to a sin. 
Let's just finish with one last thought because there is so much going on in this week's Torah portion, but there's an amazing story that, remember, he took his nephew Lot with him towards the land of Israel. And one day there's a quarrel in this week's parasha between the shepherds of Abraham and their flock and Lot. They're arguing about land. We won't get into all the discussion of the commentary, what they were arguing about, but they have a dispute. And listen to what Abraham tells his nephew. He says, listen, Lot, we're family. We shouldn't be fighting about land. <clears throat> I'll tell you why, he says. Lift up your eyes and choose. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. In other words, he says, I'll give you a first pick, which land you want, and I'll take what you don't want. But as long as we live in peace, I don't want to fight over land. And that's what happens. They make peace that way. And right after that, God promises Abraham, lift up your eyes, you're going to get the land of Israel. And rabbis say, why did God appear to Abraham right after he made this magnanimous offer to his nephew? Because God saw the way he was willing to give up the land for the sake of peace. And he wasn't going to allow material possessions like land to cause a conflict between him and his nephew. As he said, we're family. We should live together in peace. I don't want the land to be a source of dispute. You could choose whatever you want. And again, you know, we read the Torah every year because, you know, there was a rabbi who was giving a sermon and he kept on repeating the same point. And his congregation said, when are you going to stop repeating the same point? And he said, when you finally get it. Right. In other words, the Torah has to teach us these lessons because how many families have disputes over money, over inheritances, over all sorts of things. And this story right here is a very basic story. What it's saying is there's certain things that are more valuable than money. Like Abraham says to his nephew, you could pick the better land. And he picks the more fertile land, the land of Sodom. <clears throat> and that's when God says, OK, Abraham, I saw what you just did you're going to be the one to inherit the land of Israel. Because I see that you don't prize possessions above family. That's how important family is. And you know the story of King Solomon, the two mothers who are fighting over the baby. And it was the mother who said, give her the baby. That Solomon said, she's the rightful owner. Sometimes it's the person who's willing to relinquish something that proves their true ownership of something person who can't get let go of something, it means that that possession possesses them, controls them. Sometimes you people, you see people act insane when it comes to money. They'll, they won't talk to their brother for the rest of their life over whatever, piece of property, a real estate deal. And you say, does that piece of real estate have such control over you, such power over you, that you'll rather never talk to your brother for the rest of your life? which means your children won't speak to their cousins, have a family split forever over a real estate deal about a building or something. Okay, I know it's a valuable building, but his money has such a control over you. And it's the brother who says, you know what? Let's make peace. I don't care if I lose a few dollars. More important is our family should stay intact. Abraham teaches us that in this week's Torah portion. And that's just one of the beautiful stories. And the time... <laughs> The timeless lessons from the story of Abraham. And like I said, we're just scratching the surface. There's the story of Abraham going to war to rescue his, his nephew Lot. And we'll pick it up this Shabbat in Shul. Looking forward to seeing everyone. There's also going to be the first circumcision. The circumcision of Abraham and his family members. Abraham's 99 years old when he circumcises himself at the end of this week's Torah portion. Ishmael is 13 years old. And then, of course, Isaac will be the first Jewish child to be circumcised <coughs> at eight days old. So we're looking forward to seeing everyone on Shabbat and have a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you for joining. Bye.